Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. Rather than tell you what we're tearing down in this episode, I'm going to give you a clue in the form of a sound. And I bet most people know that. <laughs> So 2008, it's a year after the first generation iPhone, but it's also the year of the Nokia N95, which as far as I'm concerned is probably about the peak of the feature phone. It's about as good as they possibly got. And the iPhone 3G also came out in 2008. So side by side, they are just so different. It's not like a little different from the feature phones that existed from basically the 1980s when mobile phones first came out to the N95, which was a clear evolutionary step. But then the iPhone came out and it, it really was revolutionary. And I don't think many people would expect me to say that because I owned a Motorola A1000 a few years before in 2004, I think it was, maybe 2005, which was a touchscreen smartphone with um, Limo Linux Mobile on it. And I loved that phone. But it's not just the hardware and the form factor that made it evolutionary, it was the whole package. But how different were they on the inside? Which one should we start with? Let's go with the feature phone. So this has a front and back facing camera. They're not terrible in quality. I mean, don't get me wrong, neither of them are great. It has this slide out thing to protect the keypad and it also has a slide the other way for media controls. It's a nice little touch. Now one thing that I'd kind of forgotten about Nokia's but as soon as I picked this up, sorry rather than try and show you the screen with this sticker on shall we uh... there you go. is the unlocking which on the older phones like the 3210 that legendary brick that would break everything it was menu hash, I think it was that action to unlock. And on here, you still have to press unlock and then unlock OK to get it unlocked. And that was something so intuitive. I probably did that 60, 70 times a day at times. I wouldn't have remembered it if I hadn't seen this phone again. So let's turn it off and look at how we get inside. Now, here's something which sadly died along with this style of phone user replaceable batteries oh how we miss you even though 3.7 volts a lithium ion 3.2 watt hours or 950 milliamp hours at 3.7 volts and that probably gives you an indication i mean this phone would have lasted two three days with that that gives you an indication of how much lower power phones like this were compared to the big screens, the big touch screens. And a lot of that's the backlight. Obviously there's graphics processing going on to drive that screen, but I think a lot of it's the backlight. So the question is, where do we go from here? You've obviously got the SIM tray in here and there is a micro SD card slot on the side. Also infrared port, which is awesome. Don't know if it ever got used. Okay, this actually feels like an aluminium bezel. No, that's injection molded plastic. Just a really good one. You got that inside camera replacement screen so nothing obvious here and i don't want to pry up the pcb in the wrong direction so let's go around the back instead oh <laughs> well, the screen's making a break for it i had a five megapixel camera I, mean, I don't remember the quality being good i don't suppose the sensor was a high quality one um probably had a very low aperture on here and as a result I needed to bump the iso very high and you got grainy photos out of it but five megapixels was not horrendous for cameras at the time. And the fact that this would take an SD card for extra storage definitely made sort of carrying a camera around a viable option. Whereas I don't think previously not having a separate camera at a night out or something was an option. Oh, this is all coming to pieces. Okay. Okay, pop this little ribbon off. So the front slides up and down on this ribbon cable. So that takes all the sort of friction of going one way and then the other. And you can sort of see on here, sort of all the grub, the grime, dirty that is. And you know, it wouldn't have taken much to get some dirt in there and start puncturing, wearing that down. Camera module seems to poke right through the motherboard. First sign of an antenna. Uh, I'm not sure which band that will be, whether that's the GSM. 
don't even remember if this was 3G or not. I think it was, but I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to double check. Uh, could have been Bluetooth. This also had Wi-Fi on there. Um, although, interestingly, I did have a look, see if I could get it on my Wi-Fi at home. And uh, it basically doesn't support any modern security standards. So unless you're willing to make your uh, Wi-Fi web wide equivalency protection just for the sake of getting your Nokia online, probably not worth the hassle. So these are the two speakers, which maybe will come out. It's interesting how many um, pins and connection points there are. So you've got one, two, three up there, which came in contact with these pins up here. Those two, which are those two, they look like ground. That looks like ground plane. And then this array of one, two, three, six are these lots. And then that over there, over here, there's a lot. That little array here of six pins, that can't just be for the flash, can it? It's the only thing left on here that's really electronic. And those pins up here appear to be the antenna that are wrapped around the camera bump. Wow, lovely little speakers. The little pin, little spring-loaded pins on the back just to pick up contacts on the board. Oh, wow, look how magnetic they are. <laughs> awesome. I think they would make great parts for a portable project. Oh, okay. Tiny little um, uh, switch to tell you whether the uh, shutter cover is open because it's a manual shutter cover, lens cover. And I have to say, although it's very well adhered down, the idea of having a camera mounted on a flex PCB somehow makes me nervous. So how does that screen? Oh, okay, there we go. That's the additional connector I was expecting. So I could have flipped this board forwards and left it attached here, but I didn't know and I haven't done any damage that I know of. And then you've got a couple of... What are these? Magnesium. So those two parts are actually magnesium. And there's this speaker as well, which presses on these two square pads up there. That makes more sense. So is that a tiny little surface mount flash? Or is that just like a status light? I don't think I turned on the front facing camera to see. That is a lovely little machine though. There is a lot of parts in there. And a lot of electronics, a lot of contacts, a lot of pins. There's the sliding flexes, there's connectors. There's a lot that can go wrong in this assembly. And it's funny that from the 3210, which had that meme worthy reputation of being absolutely indestructible, we went to the N95, which I don't remember having the longest shelf life in history. It was very functional, had a lot of features. I remember having a micro SD card in it that felt like was the way things should go. But the sliding up and down mechanism, points of failure, aren't they? Even having physical buttons and this touchpad that you had to do the, the predictive texting from. Oh, honestly, opening that up and trying to type on it was like having some sort of PTSD flashback to why did we think this was a good idea? And I remember the first iteration of a smartphone, not being thrilled by that, but with 10 years under the belt, yeah, it was the right way to go. So let's compare it to its competition. So here is the eight gig iPhone 3GS, and this is from 2008. This is a semi-working version. It took a charge, it switched on, the power button is mashed and broken and the screen doesn't work. And whoever sent this to me had a thing for, maybe that's Harry Styles? I don't know, I'm showing my age there. But this clearly had an attempt at repair because it's missing the screws out the bottom and this corner just doesn't quite fit. If I squeeze it hard enough, it triggers the uh, power button. But I figured that was much better than finding an example on the internet of what is now considered a collectible and not being able to get it back together or worse, breaking it when I'm taking it apart. So I thought starting with something that didn't really work anyway was a good way to go. I'm going to assume that with my little suction cup, I can't get good suction off of the shattered screen. It'll let too much air back in to the cup, so I can't pull on it. And this will also mean I don't end up with shards of glass all over the table. Oof. Yeah, that screen was barely on there. So in this situation, the digitizer, which is the capacitive input sensor, uh, is actually bonded fairly closely with the screen, the actual display. And you've got two separate ribbons there, one for the IPS panel and one for the digitizer. 
And of course you've got this extra little ribbon cable for the speaker, if memory serves at least. And in the back here, we should have, wait, why are there numbers on here? Pretty sure that's not a stock feature. Is this the result of somebody trying to repair a phone? See, I'm a little bit torn by that 40 pin connector because it annoyed me that it was big and bulky and bespoke. Uh, I always like standard stuff like uh, micro USB, even mini USB. But I also understand why Apple liked it because that meant they had the analog outputs, they had the video outputs, they had control over the peripherals. You could have that nice unified experience of buying an iPod dock or an iPhone dock, slotting something in and it worked. You knew it was gonna work. Okay, that'll do it. So there's the frame. So this bottom assembly holds the 40 pin connector and a big chunk of plastic. Did this only have mono sound? Like on the device. Actually, I say that, I think only a lot of devices only had mono sound at the time. Um, it was quite rare that smartphones would have stereo speakers. Uh, I think like the HTC, HTC One series might have been one of the first to have it. Maybe let's pull the battery connector off. There's the motherboard out. This assembly at the bottom has this big ribbon connector that seems to do most of the heavy lifting off the 40 pin connector but also does the microphone and the speaker. And the speaker seems to sit on a resonating chamber, which strikes me as a huge use of space. And then on a sticker on the back of it, we have this, the antennas are actually stuck on as a sticker. Now, obviously the iPhone was famous for the iPhone 4 grip issues. The, what was it, the left-handed grip, where if you held your iPhone 4 or 5 like that, you killed the signal. But I don't remember the iPhone 3G having any particular issues, so maybe that was enough. So motherboard out, and we've got more screws holding in the three and a half mil jack, which I'm sure is sorely missed by a lot of people. I am, um, I'm not thrilled to see the three and a half mil jack disappear, but equally, I do feel like it's a very antiquated solution. The, the form factor has been around for like 100 years or so. It would be good to see a unified industry-wide standard that replaced it rather than just ditching it completely. Um, what do we got? Uh, 4.26 watt hours. What did I say it was over here on the Nokia? 3.2 watt hours. So that is 33% well, higher or that's 25% less. And the difference in size is, yeah, about the same actually, I guess. Okay, and there's the camera module. And there we go, that's what I was talking about earlier. This camera module, I will have to look up the spec because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But if you compare the size of the camera modules, look at it, this one's a monster. So that's everything that makes up an iPhone 3G. And I hope it's really clearly obvious that the component count is way down. And they've achieved that by changing the interface for a start. That touchscreen, that big capacitive touchscreen replaces almost all and every buttons. You've got power, volume, and a hardware silence, which is lovely but optional. Otherwise, oh, the home button as well. I can't forget the home button. So it's really interesting to see how the hardware design became really simplified when you could integrate everything onto a main motherboard and just rely on that touchscreen interface. All of a sudden, you don't have to worry about media controls, uh, primary inputs, um, having a number pad having that full QWERTY experience, even on the lower resolution and low, smaller size screens, was such a leap over predictive text. And the build quality that you get from Apple is still very high. And they've done my favorite thing here. They've embedded threads, brass threads into their plastic moldings. Excellent for reassembly. Whether you could get hold of the parts to reassemble this is a different question. The metallic bezel, which actually is really rigid. I'm not sure what metal this is, um, but yeah, this, this bezel may be stainless steel and it's certainly rigid enough and it's got that, it's kept that polished. There's no sign of corrosion or rust or anything on it, which is a bold choice for a mobile phone, which were broadly plastic. What I would like to do is see if we can pop the cans off this motherboard and compare the hardware that was actually on board. Right, I've managed to get the RF shielding off in one piece, surprisingly. 
Uh, it's not soldered on, but it is pressed on really well. And yeah, getting that off is not an easy task, especially if you're trying to do it non-destructively. So each one of these is sort of a mirror of air. So they've got the channels on the edges are allowed to press up against the metal, but the ICs have got like a little imprint of capped on tape. Maybe not. I guess some of these surface mount capacitors are a little bit high. If there was any sort of compression from the battery, they would have shorted out on the back here. So I wouldn't say it was necessary, but it is a nice precaution to see. So to me, if you condense this just down to the motherboards, it's interesting quite how similar they are. In terms of component density, features, they're pretty similar. Even the footprint is next to each other. You compare some of the hardware that's actually used. Here's the vibration motor from the iPhone. They're nearly identical. Interesting with the magnesium bodywork on here, they haven't had to shield quite so much of the phone. But again, look at the telltale tactile domes built in to the motherboard, which dominate its design and are a sign of the past. So as I said, I in 2004, 2005 had a Linux mobile with a touchscreen and very few buttons. But that was a re resistive touchscreen. You had to press hard and with a fine point to get any useful input. It even had a stylus built into the bottom corner that you could po had to poke the screen with. And I think that's why it didn't take off because until the capacitive touchscreen became widespread and with a good user interface to back up that input type, that's when it became a game changer. That speed of input, the multi-touch, the gestural input, that's what makes smartphones really clever. It's not to do with the size of the screen, the apps even, they have to follow different input, a new way of thinking. The Nokia N95 had all those evolutionary features, the, the media controls, the cameras, front and back. It, on paper, probably outperformed the iPhone. But in terms of usability and finding your way around those features, it pales in insignificance to the intuitive nature of, I can see that on the screen, I'm gonna to touch it. That's why smartphones rule. That's where they started. I realize this is probably gonna be a controversial video for a lot of people because everybody has their own opinion. And that's one of the great things about this as a topic because phones became your personal interface to the digital world. I mean, if there is any other defining point in history where computing became personal, it's the smartphone. Personal computers weren't that personal. They may have been your household computer, they may have been your office computer but they were still typically multi-user, turn-based devices. A phone, everyone has one. It's your digital personality. Look, I hope you found this an interesting episode. It's a topic that I could talk loads about. And if you've got any other phones that you'd like to see torn down, don't forget to head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Find me over there. Let's have the discussion. Let me know what you'd like to see. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time.